right, class, so welcome to another week. This afternoon and this week, you guys had lab exams um, in lab, but today in lecture, we'll be going over chapter 15, which is your respiratory system. And respiration is another word for breathing, and it includes the following processes. Um, ventilation, which is the breathing aspect of respiration. This is the movement of air into and out of your lungs. Respiration also includes the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air in the lungs and the blood. So the ability of oxygen and carbon dioxide to go from the air into the blood and from the blood back into the lungs uh, to be exhaled, that also in, is involved in respiration. Uh, the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood is also included in this idea of respiration. And then the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, between the blood and the surrounding tissues. Functions of your respiratory system are respiration, which is what we just went over. Also, the respiration system helps to regulate your blood pH levels. And it does this uh, by the ability to control your carbon dioxide levels. So how quickly you exhale carbon dioxide, that will regulate your blood pH. And that's because the levels of carbon dioxide in your body, um, carbon dioxide gets broken down into an acid in the body. So the levels of CO2 regulate your blood pH. Respiratory system includes voice production. So that occurs in the sound box, your larynx, olfaction, which is smelling and also um, innate immunity. So we have a, an immune system function involved in the respiratory system. So we divide your respiratory system into the upper and lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract includes the external nose, the nasal cavity, and the pharynx. And the pharynx is all the three different portions of your throat that we'll talk about. So here's your upper respiratory tract, the external nose, the nasal cavity, which air will go into first, and then the pharynx, which is your throat. So the pharynx is the passageway that air and food will travel down before it splits into air going through the larynx and into the trachea. And then food that entered the oral cavity will travel behind the trachea down the esophagus into um, the digestive tract. And then the lower respiratory tract then consists of all of the trachea. And the trachea is the windpipe that carries air into the lungs. The bronchi, um, are just uh, separations or divisions of the trachea, and the bronchi will continue to divide into several different pieces to travel to every kind of segment of your lungs to bring air to the lungs. So the nose, the external nose is mostly hyaline cartilage, and then the nasal cavity extends from the nares, which are your nostrils, um, all the way to the coain, which is kind of an arch-like structure in the back, um, the co coana or coane are openings to the pharynx, which are just the throat behind the no nasal cavity. And the hard palate of the nasal cavity is its roof. You have paranasal sinuses. So these are air filled spaces within the bone. They will open into the nasal cavity. They're lined with mucus. And then you have conche or concha. And these are on each kind of lateral side of the nasal cavity they will increase the surface area of the nasal cavity to help in cleaning the air, humidifying the air, and warming the air. You also have nasolacrimal ducts that are carrying tears from your eyes. So remember, you have the lacrimal apparatus in your eyes that are creating tears constantly um, to clean out your eyes, and those tears will drain into the nasal cavity as well. Uh, functions of the nose, it, it helps to filter the air. It's um, the airway for respiration. So where breathing of inhaling and exhaling will occur if you're not using your mouth. Um, you kind of always want to use your nose when you are breathing because your nose is what contains the mucosa, the hairs that to help with filtering the air. So always try to breathe uh, through your nose. Even when uh, working out and running, for example, um, always see if you can breathe through your nose. Um, the nose also is involved in speech with the paranasal sinus, sinuses, the spaces providing some resonant chambers. Uh, the nose has olfactory receptors for smell. Your nose helps to warm the air. And then sneezing in the nose helps to dislodge any material from the nose. So sneezing is a natural good process uh, to get anything out of the nose that could be stuck. The pharynx then is your throat. So this is the common passageway 
for the respiratory and your digestive system. So um, air and food will both share the pharynx, not necessarily the nasopharynx. You usually don't get um, food up through your nose unless you're laughing or you're spitting something out. But your nasopharynx will take in air and then the oropharynx extends from the uvula and the uvula is the little um, uh, boxing ball type structure that hangs in the back of your throat to the epiglottis and I'll show you pictures of this. Your oropharynx takes in food, drink and air and then the laryngopharynx extends from the epiglottis to the esophagus and food and drink pass through this part of the pharynx as well. So the uvula is the little grape uh, that hangs down in the back of the throat. It's an extension of the soft palate and the pharyngeal tonsils are a part of the pharynx and they contain some immune tissue that help to aid in def defending against infection. So it's a good place to have some immune tissue where everything is entering your body uh, to kind of be right at the source of entrance for all of these things entering uh, to try to defend against any infections that could be possibly brought in uh, through your nose or mouth. So here we have a really good sagittal view or medial view structure of the nasal cavity and pharynx. You can see some paranasal sinuses, sinuses, which are spaces within the bone. Here itself is the nasal cavity and you see the concha, which are kind of like these ridges on the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. And again, they help to provide surface area. They warm the air, humidify the air. Um, so those are the concha. You can see here behind the nasal cavity is the nasopharynx. So this is these kind of this throat area is all the pharynx and the nasopharynx is the area right behind the nasal cavity and the oropharynx is the area behind the oral cavity while the laryngopharynx is the area behind the larynx. And we can kind of see some divisions here. So here we have the uvula. So I'm just gonna kind of highlight the uvula. Um, the uvula is a part of the soft palate. So if you reach up and touch the roof of your mouth, you could probably feel the hard palate, but then way in the back, it's made up of the soft palate. And the soft palate will actually raise and try to kind of close off the opening to the nasal cavity when you do swallow so that food goes down your esophagus and not up through your nose. Um, this structure right here is called the epiglottis. It's the first part of the larynx. And the epiglottis is a piece of hyaline cartilage. It's like a flap that will cover and close over the opening of the larynx when you also swallow. So when you're swallowing food or drink, the epiglottis will close and cover the opening to the larynx so that food and drink travels posteriorly down through the esophagus and it doesn't travel through your larynx. You don't wanna get food or drink in your larynx or your trachea. If you get food, you might choke and die, or you might have to cough it back out. Um, if you get a little bit of water or food down the wrong pipe, um, it's literally down the wrong pipe. It's down the larynx and trachea instead of going down the esophagus. So those are some structures of the nasal cavity and the pharynx. Then the lower respiratory tract is made up of the lower portions of your larynx. And again, the larynx is another word for your voice box. So um, shown here is your larynx. You'll see vocal folds, vestibular folds, different pieces of cartilage that'll always maintain it open at all times. Um, so the lower parts of the larynx are part of the lower respiratory tract, along with the trachea and bronchi and lungs. So again, here we have the lower respiratory tract. You see your larynx. Um, the trachea is the windpipe taking air into either lung. And the bronchi is the first kind of splitting of the trachea as it goes to each lung. So the larynx is located in the anterior throat. You can feel your thyroid cartilage. And if you're a male, you feel your Adam's apple or kind of the prominence of your thyroid cartilage um, a little bit more because the testosterone that males are secreting that starts during puberty um, creates their thyroid cartilage to be larger. And that's mainly because the testosterone is also making their vocal cords longer and that lowers the voice of males. So larynx consists of different cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is the largest piece. That's called the Adam's apple. The epiglottis is a piece of cartilage inside the larynx, which is like that flap that will cover over and prevent swallowed materials from entering the larynx. The vocal folds or vocal cords are a source of voice production. When air moves past your vocal folds, 
uh, they will vibrate and that produces sound. The force of the air moving past your vocal folds determines how loud you speak. And then the tension of the vocal folds actually determines the pitch. Laryngitis, we have an itis word. And again, itis means inflammation. So this is inflammation of the vocal folds. And this can be caused by overuse if you talk a lot. Um, dry air, so if you're in, in an area that um, is not humid at all, so it's very dry, um, or an infection. So here we have anatomy of the larynx. You can see the different pieces of cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is the largest one shown on the front. You have the piece of cricoid, cricoid cartilage that's on the posterior side. You see kind of tracheal cartilage rings, which keep your trachea open at all times, which is a good thing. We want our windpipe to be open all the time. So air is constantly being able to get into our lungs. And then here's a good view of the epiglottis. You can see that it looks like a tongue or a flap. And again, that will kind of close and make a tight seal over the opening of the larynx when you swallow. Um, from this medial or sag medial view, you can also see um, your vestibular fold, which is the false vocal cord, and then the vocal fold itself, which is the true vocal cord. This is a look kind of superiorly into your vocal folds. Um, the glottis is the space of between them that opens. And then again, you have kind of false vocal cords lateral to the true vocal cords, which are in white here. And this is a, an actual look at someone's vocal folds um, through a laryngoscope. So they put a tube down their throat with a camera and they can actually see their vocal folds, which is kind of cool. You can even kind of start to see the rings, the highly cartilage rings that are holding open the trachea as well. So the trachea itself is the windpipe. It consists of about 16 to 20 of those C-shaped pieces of cartilage that hold it open. It contains the epithelial, the epithelial tissue, cilia pseudostratified columnar. And I think I mentioned this way at the beginning that smoke, smoking actually destroys the cilia. Um, coughing dislodges materials from the trachea, and your trachea eventually divides into the right and left bronchi, which take air into the lungs. If you are a heavy smoker, if you stop today, the cilia will be able to regrow or grow back, um, but smoking can totally damage the lining of your trachea, um, which is again bad because then your trachea will be able to trap harmful things and get them out that, it's being, that is breathing in. So the bronchi divide from the trachea, they connect to the lungs. They are also lined with cilia and they still contain these pieces of cartilage to help keep them open. The lungs then are the primary organ of respiration. They're cone shaped. The base of the lungs rests on the diaphragm and the apex extends above your clavicle. So you can feel your collarbone and your, the apex or the pointed part of the lungs will actually extend above that. Uh, the right lung has three lobes to it, and the left lung only has two lobes because the left lung leaves space for the heart. Yes, Cameron, so that's why you have a smoker's cough, so smokers aren't able to trap harmful things that they breathe in, um, so smokers have to, to basically cough everything out, um, anything harmful particles that they breathe in because their epithelial tissue, the lining of their trachea, doesn't work to trap anything bad they breathe in. Uh, the lungs itself contain many more air passageways and divisions that come from uh, the bronchi. So the lung airway passages, so when we talk about the trachea coming down and then splitting into primary bronchi to take air to either the right lung or the left lung, um, those bronchi continue to branch into, to go to the different lobes of the lungs. So these are called secondary bronchi. Those will branch to go to the different segments of the lungs called tertiary bronchi. Bronchi will branch to form bronchioles and then terminal bronchioles. And eventually they'll form respiratory bronchioles, turn into alveolar ducts, and then turn into alveoli. Um, which are structures that will become smaller even more, but alveoli then are kind of like these clusters of uh, grapes where the air and gas exchange will occur. So here's how the anatomy of the trachea kind of splits. So you, you see your trachea coming down. The carina is just the point where the um, trachea will split into either lung. 
So when something goes down the wrong pipe, is there any other way to get it out other than coffee? Well, you can do the Heimlich maneuver. If it, you know, you, you hear people doing the Heimlich, you know, they put pressure kind of right below the diaphragm to put force pressure up into the trachea to kind of push whatever's lodged or stuck. So that's the Heimlich maneuver. Um, otherwise, that's why, you know, choking um, little pieces that kids eat, it's, it's really dangerous. And kids die from this all the time. They die from choking on pieces of popcorn, on marbles. That's like, I think every patient's parents fear. Um, but no, there's not really any other way to get it out besides coughing, the Heimlich maneuver, um, because usually if there is a significant blockage in your trachea, um, you know, lack of airflow to your lungs can, you just, you can't live that long without airflow inconsistently. So that's why it's kind of scary to get something blocked in there. Good question. So here we have the trachea dividing into the primary bronchi, then into the secondary bronchi, going to the lobes of the lung, into the tertiary bronchi, which are separating to go into the different segments of each lobe, and then the bronchioles, and then the terminal bronchioles are kind of where they end, and we'll even zoom in more at the next picture. You can also see from this picture um, the upper, the middle, and the lower lobe of the right lung, and just the upper and lower lobe of the left lung. You can kind of see here this space. This is called the cardiac notch. Um, this is kind of the space. Remember, your heart sits a little bit to the left of the sternum, so your left lung leaves a little bit of a space for your heart to sit, and that's why the right lung is a little bit larger. So here we have an area called the high lung. So we're looking at each lung from a medial point of view. And the high lung is the area where all the bronchi enter and all the blood vessels enter. You can see that high lung there. Um, you also see this cardiac impression and cardiac notch where the heart will sit into uh, the left lung. The alveoli then are like small air sacs. They look like clusters of grapes and this is where gas exchange occurs. They are surrounded by capillaries. So tiny blood vessels are surrounding um, these kind of air sacs. And you have about 300 million alveoli in your lungs. And an asthma attack, so someone who has troubles with asthma, is when their terminal bronchioles are constricting or contracting that are leading to reduced airflow into these alveoli. So here's a look at bronchioles and alveoli. So here we have a bronchial coming down, changing its name into a terminal bronchial, respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, and eventually we get to these alveolar sacs, which again are these kind of clusters of air sacs. And you can see here how that surrounding these alveoli are your capillaries. So what happens here, these walls of the alveoli are incredibly thin. So that air that's within these alveolar sacs will diffuse into the blood vessels. So oxygen um, travels across the walls of the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries and carbon dioxide travels from the pulmonary capillaries back into the alveolar sacs so that we can exhale carbon dioxide. So that's how oxygen gets from inside your bronchioles, inside these alveolar sacs, It'll diffuse across the wall and travel into these pulmonary capillaries. The respiratory membrane itself in the lungs, if this is where gas exchange between air and the blood occurs, and it's formed by the walls of your alveoli as well as your capillaries. Alveolar ducts and respiratory bronchioles will also contribute, and the respiratory membrane is very thin so that your oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse easily across it. And we'll show you a picture of the respiratory membrane. It's made up of a thin layer of fluid from your alveolus, the alveolar epithelium, which is incredibly thin, the basement membrane, thin interstitial space. So there's a little bit of space between the alveolar sac and the capillary, and then the basement membrane of the capillary, and then the capillary endothelium. So let's look here. So what we're looking at here is one of the alveolar sacs, and we're looking at the airspace within one alveolar sac, and you can kind of see surrounding it, you see a macrophage, which is one of your immune cells to help kind of eat up anything harmful, and then you see your capillary walls that are kind of right up against the wall of the alveolar. And if we look at this picture, we have a zoomed in picture showing the alveolar sac, 
and we show, we're showing the capillary with one red blood cell in it to show kind of how thin this respiratory membrane is. So that means um, the respiratory membrane is just kind of the division between the air and the alveolus and your red blood cells. And it's an, it's an incredibly thin membrane so that oxygen will diffuse from the air into the red blood cell and carbon dioxide will diffuse from the red blood cell out into the alveolus, into the air, so we can exhale it. Um, more membranes and cavities that actually surround the lungs. So um, pleura has to do with the lungs. So pleura, or that prefix pleur. So the pleura itself is a double layered membrane around the lungs. The parietal pleura is actually the membrane that lines the cavity, the thoracic cavity that the lungs sit in. And the visceral pleura will cover the lungs surface themselves. So viscera again means, means organs. So the visceral pleura will cover the organ, the lungs itself, and then the pleura cavity will be a little space around each lung. So here we have a superior view taking a transverse section, and we can see the layers of the pleura here nicely. So you see your vertebra, your esophagus, your bronchi going to the right and left lung. But what we're focusing on here is in blue. So you see in blue is the parietal pleura, and the blue parietal pleura lines the thoracic cavity itself. And then in red, the red is the visceral pleura that will line or cover the lungs themselves with the pleural cavity being the space between the two. So that's what the pleural cavities and membranes are. So ventilation then is the process of breathing. It moves air into and out of the lungs it uses the diaphragm, so this is the important, uh, most important muscle in breathing. It's a skeletal muscle that separates your thoracic and abdominal cavities. Inspiration breathes in, and to inspire, you are using your external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. And then to uh, expire or breathe out, you're using the, just the diaphragm. And if you're trying to breathe out a little bit more, called a forceful expiration, you use internal intercostal muscles. And again, the intercostal muscles are the muscles that sit between your ribs that surround the thoracic cavity. So here we have um, looking at the end of expiration. So after you completely breathe out, your diaphragm is relaxed. And the relaxed kind of shape of the diaphragm makes a kind of a cone-like structure because um, it, you, don't, you don't have air in the lungs. It's just relaxing. And then at the end of inspiration, so when you're inspired, you're taking air into the lungs and you're making your thoracic cavity larger. So your diaphragm is contracting and increasing the dimension or the space of the thoracic cavity. So your diaphragm is no longer cone-shaped, but it kind of flattens out and moves its way down. So that's these are some of the um, muscles of respiration and how they affect thoracic volume. And again, you know that when you breathe in, your rib cage, your thoracic volume increases. And when you breathe out, the thoracic cage or volume decreases. Pressure changes also help with airflow. Um, and this is really important because pressure or air is kind of sucked in to the lungs due to pressure changes. So when the thoracic cavity volume increases, your pressure decreases. And when thoracic cavity volume decreases, the pressure increases. So what this means here for a second, um, and we should talk about this first, that airflow will always, air will always flow from an area to high to low pressure. So what that means now is when your thoracic cavity volume increases, like when you're trying to breathe in, the pressure will inside your lungs is decreasing because a larger area, um, the air inside of it, the pressure will decrease. So when that happens, the air outside the body is at a higher pressure because the air inside your lungs is at a lower pressure because we've increased the thoracic volume. When that happens, air kind of naturally um, passively gets sucked into the lungs as air is flowing from an area of high pressure outside the body to an area of lower pressure inside your lungs. And then when we're exhaling, so when your th thoracic cavity volume decreases or gets smaller, pressure is increasing inside the lungs because the space is getting smaller as you decrease the space. So as you exhale, air will naturally flow out of the lungs um, to go from an area of high pressure inside the lungs 
to an area of low pressure outside the body. So specifically when you inspire, when you inhale, the diaphragm descends, the rib cage expands, thoracic cavity volume increases and pressure decreases inside your lungs. So then air will move naturally into the alveoli and into your lungs. And that's really important because we want the air to get all the way down to the alveoli. So this idea of pressure change is really important to kind of help suck the air in to get all the way into the alveoli. Then in expiration, your diaphragm relaxes again. It kind of takes on that kind of cone shape. The rib cage gets smaller. Thoracic cavity volume decreases. So pressure is kind of raising up inside your lungs. So then air will naturally move out of your lungs to go from an area of high pressure inside your alveoli and then out of the body. So the thoracic cavity itself, when you are heading up into higher altitude, um, that has to do more with the density of the air with oxygen that's present. Um, I don't think the thoracic cavity itself is affected. I think it can still increase and decrease the same amount of space. Um, but you're talking more about the, the oxygen um, availability in higher altitude. And I'll maybe look into a little bit more about that. So I mean, most of you guys, you're pretty much close to sea level unless you Kaipa is a little bit higher. And some of you, I know, I think actually live in the mountains. Um, I, as many of you know, I'm in Ecuador, I'm in Quito right now, and I'm at about 9,000 feet right now. Um, so usually people have to take altitude medication before they get here, and people are usually sick when they come visit us. But yeah, that more has, I think the, the rib cage itself is not um, kind of changed. It's more uh, the presence of oxygen and the I kind of outside the body. I'll look more into that too. Good question. So this is just describing um, the pressure changes inside the lungs as you um, inhale and as you exhale. And again, really simply put, you know, when you're inhaling, um, your lungs are getting bigger. So the pressure inside your lungs is decreasing. So air will rush in. And then when you exhale, your lungs get smaller. So pressure increases. So that air wants to leave. So the air will want to leave the body. The idea of the lungs recoiling is just the tendency for an expanded lung to decrease in size. And this can occur during quiet expiration, so quiet breathing, and it's due to elastic fibers and a thin film of fluid lining the alveoli. So your lungs have the ability to increase in size and decrease in size. And if you're quietly breathing or quietly expiring, meaning you're not trying to force air out of your lungs, you know, you're just quietly expiring, um, your lungs will just recoil naturally as well. Surfactant is very important. It's a fluid and it's a mixture, mixture of lipoproteins that's produced by a type of secretory cell from your alveolar air sacs. Um, it's a single fluid layer on the surface of your thin fluid lining alveoli. And what surfractant does is it reduces surface tension in the alveoli. And this is the big one. It keeps your lungs from collapsing. Specifically, it keeps your alveoli inflated. So remember your alveoli look like air sacs. Think of them like little tiny balloons. Surfractants keeps them from collapsing um, so that they're constantly open at all times. And I'll just come back and talk about surfractant a little bit. I think we cover it. If not, I'll bring it up. Um, or I'll talk about it right now in um, premature infant birth. Um, their lungs are not fully developed yet. So really, I mean, this can occur, you know, I, the weeks, I can't remember specifically, um, but in premature birth, usually the main area of concern is that their lungs aren't developed yet meaning that their lung, their alveolar cells are not producing surfractant yet. And if they, these premature infants who've been born don't have surfractant, um, their lungs, their alveoli could collapse. Um, so kind of one way to alleviate this is we have artificial surfractant that's usually given to premature infants and just to help them breathe before their lungs are fully developed and can secrete the surfractant on their own. The pleural pressure is the pleural, the pressure in the pleural cavity, which is the space between membranes. It's less than alveolar pressure, and this also helps to keep the alveoli from collapsing. Um, other factors that influence pulmonary ventilation is your lung 
elasticity. So lungs always need to recoil between ventilations, kind of relax and go back to being smaller. And this is decreased by emphysema. Um, lung compliance is the expansion of the thoracic cavity, and this can be affected if the rib cage is damaged. Um, and then the respiratory passageway resistance occurs during an asthma attack, infection, or a tumor if it's blocking an area. How does surfractant reduce surface tension? So good question, Kathy, and I wish I had a picture that kind of shows this. So, um, so think of the alveoli as being, you know, kind of, I guess I should say, you know, little tiny balloons. And think about, you know, if they didn't have this layer of fluid along the walls of the alveoli, they would get kind of sticky and they would kind of collapse. So reducing surface tension means that it's keeping them from kind of um, getting sticky and kind of collapsing on themselves. So when you kind of keep this layer of fluid, of surfractant along the walls, um, they'll be able to not kind of stick together. So they'll stay um, inflated if that helps. That's the idea of kind of reducing surface tension. I don't know if that was a good explanation or not. Kind of like a fluid skeleton, yes. But surface tension, yeah, mm -hmm. good question. All right, so pulmonary volume. So it's really important that we're taking in enough air and that we're taking, when the, we're breathing out all the carbon dioxide that we should. So this is a common kind of diagnostic measuring tool to measure how much air you're taking in and how much air you're exhaling. And we can use a spirometer, which is a device that measures our pulmonary volumes, which are the volumes of air that our lungs take in and out. And we have different ways of measuring and kind of labeling different types of air or different quantities of air, depending on what's happening with it. The tidal volume is the um, definition that we give to our air that we inspire and expire during quiet breathing. So this is kind of tidal volume, kind of what all we're probably doing right now, unless some of you are like working out during this lecture, which kudos to you. But tidal volume is just normal, kind of quiet breathing, inhaling and exhaling. The inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that we can kind of breathe in forcefully after a normal inspiration. So, you know, let's see, you can hold their breath the longest underwater. This would be breathing in inspiratory reserve volume. So kind of breathing in more forcefully than what we normally do. Expiratory reserve volume is the opposite, the volume of air that can be expired forcefully. So normal expire, and then after you normally exhale, you can still kind of blow out even more air. So that's the expiratory reserve volume. And then the residual volume is the volume of air that always remains in your lungs after a maximal expiration. So even after you try to breathe out as much air as you can, you can never breathe out the residual volume. This volume always remains in your lungs. We can't measure it with a spirometer because the spirometer is a device that measures airflow in and out. So because we can never get the residual volume out of our lungs, we can never really measure um, the residual volume. And then we can calculate out vital capacities and total lung capacities. Um, the vital capacity is the maximum amount of air a person can expire um, after a maximum inspiration. So we add up our inspiration and expiration reserve volumes plus our normal tidal volumes. And then the total lung capacity is just adding up um, the residual volume, the volume of air that's in the lungs at all times, plus the vital capacity. So here we have, I know I didn't say we can't really um, determine with a spirometer how much air is left in our residual volume capacity, what's left in our lungs. Um, and actually, I'm not sure how they would even get that amount. I'm assuming maybe from um, cadavers or, you know, recently deceased, there would be a way to measure the residual, residual volume. But this is kind of a graph then that we use to show tidal volume. So this is tidal volume up and down, normal inspiration and expiration. Um, the maximum inspiration you can get, so the volume of air that you can take in, the maximum expiration. And then you can see our capacities that we can calculate out on the right side, total lung capacity, the vital capacity, and then inspiratory capacity. And you can calculate your vital capacity and your total lung capacity just based on your um, gender, uh, how tall you are, because your height will affect how big your thoracic cage is, your lungs are. So you can kind of estimate 
your vital capacity and your total lung capacity. And there's charts that you can find online um, using your height for that. The spirometer, the tool they give patients after surgery. Um, are you talking about in recovery when they're giving them, I think, you know, they're helping them wake up, Cameron? I don't know if they, some might be, but I, my daughter was just in surgery and what they were putting over her mouth giving her excess oxygen to help her wake up a little bit and just to make sure she's getting enough oxygen. So it does look like a mask, but the spirometer itself, which I'm sorry, I don't even actually show a picture of. Let me just search quick for you, for you guys to show you what this spirometer is, but it's not necessarily what um, they give you after surgery. I think that's, I think that has to do with their making sure you're um, breathing in oxygen to kind of make sure you're waking up okay after the anesthesia spirometer device and let's just look at a picture of this and then i'll share my screen all right okay so let's look at what a spirometer was and if you guys go on to more taking more anatomy and physiology classes um so the spirometer advice usually has a tube so this is maybe a good picture of it where you kind of are breathing directly into a tube and then it's just directly connected to a machine that is measuring your values. Some older spirometers will have kind of balls associated with that will move up and down when you breathe out. Um, but again, this is maybe a good picture. You just see kind of a mouthpiece then connected to the airflow machine um, that is able to kind of monitor or measure all the airflow that's traveling into and out of your lungs. So the first, so after surgery, that could be to measure, to make sure the person is breathing enough, Cameron. You guys might know more about this than I do with your medical experience. Um, they could be hooking them up to a spirometer to make sure that they are, um, you know, they're measuring their air capacity right there to make sure they're getting enough air. Great questions, guys. I appreciate the active participation and active listening. It makes online classes a little more interesting. Okay, so factors that influence your pulmonary volume, so your gender, um, males usually can take in more air lungs, and that's partly due to the fact that they're just, their thoracic cavity is built larger. Um, your age will affect your pulmonary volumes, and your height and your weight can also affect pulmonary volumes. So gas exchange then is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide that occurs at the respiratory membrane. So this is where gas exchange between the blood and the air occurs in the primary alveoli, those air sacs. Um, some of it will occur in respiratory bronchioles and alveolar ducts. How does anesthesia collapse the alveoli? I, I don't think it does. Because even under anesthesia, the person would still need to breathe. Um, you know, they might, they, what anesthesia sometimes they do, they put a tube down the throat. What's the tube called, guys? And they're being intubated. Um, I don't think anesthesia causes collapse of the alveoli. Yes, the endotracheal tube. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> See, you guys know a lot more of the, these medical applications than I do. Yeah, the anesthesia won't cause the collapse of the alveoli. That would be incredibly bad if it did because you'd lose patients all the time, but they might put a, a trach tube down to kind of keep more um, the bronchioles and the airway completely open so that air is able to flow in. All right, so respiratory membrane, let me just go back, what did I miss here? Um, it never occurs, so gas exchange never occurs in bronchioles, bronchi, or trachea. And it's always influenced by the thickness of the membrane, the total area of the membrane, and the partial pressure of the gases. And what that means is, you know, the pressure of the gases, so oxygen and carbon dioxide, oxygen will always naturally flow into, into the blood because it'll be more concentrated in the air, in the air sacs, than in the red blood cells. And carbon dioxide will always diffuse out of the blood into the air sacs more easily. The respiratory membrane thickness itself will decrease the rate of diffusion. Pulmonary edema, so swelling in the lungs will decrease diffusion uh, so that the rate of gas exchange is decreased. Oxygen exchange is always usually more effective than carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide for some reason can always diffuse more easily than oxygen. 
uh, the total surface area of the membrane itself. So this means the total surface area of those little alveolar sacs surrounded by capillaries is about the size of a basketball court. And the respiratory membrane surface area is important because it can sometimes decrease due to de removal of lung tissue. Um, think of cystic fibrosis, um, cancer of the lungs, destruction from cancer, or even emphysema. Hyperinflation of emphysema due to damage of surfractants. I'm not sure, Kathy, you're always asking me great questions that I don't know how to answer. Hyperinflation due to damage. I'm not sure if that, yeah, is due to damage of the surfractants. You know, normally surfractant fluid, um, it's only a problem, you know, when we're adults, we're, we're creating plenty of surfractant. Um, it's only in the case really of premature infants, even a couple of weeks premature if they're born. Um, actually, I think it's anything before 36 that it's a problem because, you know, premature, their lungs aren't developing that surfractant, but it could be associated with other things. I'm not sure. If you find out, Kathy, you can let me know them. So when we talk about partial pressure, this is the pressure exerted by a specific gas in a mixture of gases. So this is the pressure. Also think of it kind of as the amount of oxygen or carbon dioxide in the mixture. The total atmospheric pressure of all gases at sea level, for example, is 760 millimeters of mercury. So we always measure pressure of gases in millimeters of mercury. And you might have, um, maybe some of you have the, I can't think now, in your houses that measure gas pressure in millimeters of mercury. What's that? My dad would have one and he would be able to tell when a storm was coming because the air pressure would drop. Anyway, so this is what we're kind of talking here about is the um, atmospheric pressure and then the pressure of gases. Barometric barometer, yes, thank you guys. See, what would I do without you? I'd be lost. How do I get through my day when I'm not in class? Thank you, the barometer measures the, the pressures. Do any of you guys have a barometer in your home or was that just my dad, an old man thing? So the partial pressure in the atmosphere of oxygen is 21%, and the partial pressure um, for oxygen itself is 160 millimeters of mercury. So what this means um, is just that oxygen will naturally go from an area of high partial pressure to low partial pressure. So when you breathe in oxygen to your alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen will be much lower in your red blood cells. So that oxygen will just naturally travel um, from the air that you breathe in and then into your red blood cells. And when we label it with an upper level, upper case letter P, and then the certain gas to represent its partial pressure value. So the diffusion of gases in the lungs, um, the cells in your body use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. And I don't know if we really get into how that happens but all the cells in your body need oxygen to produce energy. So that's why we need to breathe in oxygen. And without oxygen, our cells could not produce the energy that's needed to perform all the functions that we go through constantly, consistently, every second of every day. Um, and then when our cells produce that oxygen, a waste product, or when, you're, when our cells are using oxygen produced to produce ATP or energy, they always produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. And the blood returning from the tissues and entering the lungs will have a decreased oxygen partial pressure because it offloaded its oxygen, but it will have an increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide so that the blood returning from the tissues to the lungs will be low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide so that oxygen that's in the alveolar air sacs will diffuse naturally into your pulmonary capillaries and ca carbon dioxide, so the blood coming to the lungs that's high in carbon dioxide, it will diffuse naturally and passively back into the alveoli so that we can exhale the carbon dioxide or the waste. So this is just showing you gas exchange. Again, kind of if we start down here in the tissues of cells. So again, the left side of the heart pumps oxygenated blood to all of our tissues. When um, these arteries turn into capillaries, you remember gas exchange always occurs at the capillary level where the layers of the blood vessels are extremely thin. This is showing you the differences in the partial pressures of these gases. So you can see here, we have a very high partial pressure of oxygen. So oxygen will diffuse into the surrounding tissues, the cells that need oxygen. Carbon dioxide pressure is low so that the carbon dioxide from your tissues will diffuse into the blood. 
that blood then goes back to the heart. The heart pumps that deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And then from the lungs, that carbon dioxide, which is much higher in partial pressure, will diffuse into the lungs to be exhaled. And the partial pressure of oxygen is much, much higher in the air sacs. You can see it's 104. So the oxygen will naturally diffuse into the pulmonary capillaries. So this is the idea of gas exchange, picking up oxygen from the lungs, offloading it into the tissues, and then doing the reverse with carbon dioxide. We always need to get rid of carbon dioxide because it's a waste product of our cells producing ATP. And if carbon dioxide um, builds up in our tissues, in our blood, our blood will become acidic. Uh, so the diffusion of gases in the tissue, so this describes how blood flows from your lungs through the left side of the heart to the tissue capillaries where oxygen diffuses into the interstitial space. Um, oxygen diffuses from the interst interstitial fluid into the cells is much less because carbon dioxide is what is being picked up. So this is another look at gas exchange in the tissues, specifically, again, Let's look down here first. So we see how hemoglobin carries oxygen. Hemoglobin is going to offload oxygen into the tissue cells. And then we have carbon dioxide being picked up by our red blood cells. And this little kind of um, chemical formula right here, you kind of see how carbon dioxide gets breaking down, broken down into this bicarbonate and bicarbonate anion. Um, this is what will, if you, we have too much carbon dioxide in our blood, that increases the acidity of our blood. So more gas exchange now in the lungs, showing how, again, carbon dioxide kind of reforms after being the bicarbonate ion. Carbon dioxide leaves the cells, goes back into the air sac so we can exhale it. And on the other side of the red blood cell, oxygen is entering that red blood cell and forming um, or being bound with hemoglobin, which carries oxygen in our red blood cells. So this talks a little bit about carbon dioxide transport in the blood and how it affects the pH of our blood. Um, carbon dioxide, when it enters your blood and is transported, it combines with other blood proteins and bicarbonate ions. It will always react to, with water, there should be an arrow here, to form carbonic acid. And bicarbonate ions dissociate from that carbonic acid to form a hydrogen ion and this bicarbonate ion. What this just means is that when carbon dioxide is being transported in your red blood cells, it's not being transported as carbonic or um, carbon dioxide as oxygen. Oxygen is transported as oxygen. Carbon dioxide kind of goes through a series of chemical reactions, and it's mainly transported in your red blood cells as this bicarbonate ion. Carbonic anhydrase in the red blood cell increases the rate of carbon dioxide reacting with water. And again, if we have too much carbon dioxide levels in the blood, um, this will increase your blood pH. So your blood, so what, what this is meaning, this, is, this sentence does not make any sense, but if you have too many um, carbon dioxide levels in the, in the blood, your blood pH decreases. And this means that your blood pH becomes more acidic. So if you, again, um, are not exhaling carbon dioxide as you should, the carbon dioxide will build up in your blood, decreasing the pH levels and making your blood more acidic. The normal respiratory rate is about 12 to 20 respirations per minute, and a respiration is an inhale and an exhale. So you can calculate out your respiratory rate, uh, but it should be about 12 to 20 inhales and exhales per minute. So that's one um, respiration. In children, the rates can be higher and can vary from 20 to 40. The rhythm is controlled by neurons in the brain, the medulla oblongata, and the rate is determined by the number of times your respiratory muscles are stimulated. So here we have respiratory structures in the brain, specifically in the medulla oblongata, the medullary respiratory center, um, that they will um, stimulate your external, internal, intercostal muscles, as well as your diaphragm. And certain things can increase your respiratory rate, such as your sympathetic nervous system will cause you to breathe more, and your parasympathetic nervous system will lower your respiratory rate, causing you to breathe less if you're just resting and digesting. Higher brain centers allow for voluntary breathing um, so that we can kind of voluntarily control our breath. 
Um, not always, because you're still breathing when you're sleeping, but higher brain centers at times can allow for you to voluntarily take in a deep breath and, you know, exhale a deep breath. Emotions and speech can affect breathing. So sometimes if I'm talking a lot, I forget to breathe, and then I have to just take a minute to stop. Emotions, if you're nervous, if you're angry, um, the herring brewer reflex will inhibit the respiratory center when the lungs are stretched during respiration. So you cannot, you can only breathe in so much. Your, your lungs can't stretch forever. So this is just some nervous and chemical mechanisms of breathing. Um, you know, one thing that I'll talk about is your levels of carbon dioxide. You know, if you have too many, too much carbon dioxide in the blood, um, that will build up and make your blood very acidic. So in response to that, you have a reflex in your body that will cause you to hyperventilate. So if your body starts to become, or your blood in your body starts to become very acidic, you will automatically start hyperventilating to try to get out the excess carbon dioxide that has been built up and causing your blood to become acidic. And the opposite is true. If your blood becomes too basic, so if you don't have enough um, carbon dioxide in the blood, you'll breathe a lot kind of slower um, to try or more shallowly to kind of retain more carbon dioxide to affect the blood pH level. So again, the levels of carbon dioxide are the sole kind of, not sole, but one of the main controllers of your pH levels in your blood. And the last two slides kind of talk about this. So your chemoreceptors in your medulla will respond to changes in blood pH. Blood pH levels, again, are produced by changes in blood carbon dioxide levels. If you increase your carbon dioxide inside your body, you're increasing the acidity of the blood and that decreases the pH. Because remember on the pH scale, increased acidity is always less than seven. So if that happens, if your blood pH lowers, it becomes very acidic, you're kind of retaining too much carbon dioxide, the result of your body is to increase breathing or hyperventilating to try to get out this excess carbon dioxide that has been kind of kept inside. If you have a low blood, level of oxygen, for example, this will stimulate chemoreceptors in your carotid and aortic bar bodies to increase breathing. So they're also able to measure the levels of the chemicals, the oxygen. So if you don't have enough oxygen, for example, in your body, um, your body eventually or naturally will just start breathing more. And this is the regulation of blood pH. So if we have a blood pH level increasing, um, this will decrease breathing. So this is if you don't have enough acidity, if your blood is becoming too basic, it will decrease the breathing to try to retain more carbon dioxide to bring our homeostasis back to normal. If our blood pH decreases, meaning it's becoming too acidic, we have too much CO2 in the body. So your uh, body will naturally increase breathing to try to exhale or get rid of excess CO2 levels. So I think that's the end of this chapter. I'll go ahead and end the recording and answer any final questions.